Since our first webinar in the fall, we've covered topics such as financial impacts to solid waste services during the pandemic, designing and constructing and operating landfill facilities in a sustainable manner with changing climate conditions, addressing odors at solid waste management facilities and landfill redevelopment. Our webinar today is an interesting topic on the use of drones to improve the operation of solid waste facilities and in, in particular, assess physical and, and environmental conditions associated with those facilities. The use of drones is not new, uh, but what we are doing with drones today is, and our webinar, webinar deals with how we are using drones to conduct various field studies, surveys and measurements, and monitoring for solid waste, environmental and energy facilities. Let me introduce our panel today. I have Melissa Rousseau and Phil Carrillo. Uh, Melissa is our business manager for SCS Remote Monitoring and Control, we call it RMC, uh, Drone Services. And Phil is the director of our RMC and Control uh, Program. Our panelists bring extensive ex experience in this area. They also have solid waste experience and landfill management experience. They're licensed pilots flying and assessing over 120 landfills, pipelines, and other infrastructures. They've got experience in remote monitoring and control, including supervisory control and data acquisition systems, commonly referred to as SCADA, air quality compliance and pollutant dispersion and air measurement programs. The team will hopefully will have a chance to answer your questions throughout this presentation as they begin discussing various elements of the drone program. And so hopefully you will take advantage of that. Where are we gonna to go today? We're gonna to cover a wide range of top topics dealing with the use of drones. We're gonna cover things such as aerial photography, aerial topographic surveys, field, field sequence monitoring, thermal imagery, gas monitoring, flora and fauna surveys, habitat surveys, emergency response and documentation, stream and erosion control and sedimentation, utility pipeline alignments, and infrastructure inspections. All the uses can provide a comprehensive information to you, our clients, in a timely manner to improve how you operate your sites and how you are stewards of the various environmental assets that are under your management. So Phil, um, in terms of a little bit about yourself, I, I kind of introduced you as to what your role in SES, but you might tell a little bit about yourself and then maybe talk a little bit about the types of drones that are actually being used so that everybody understands what we're talking about. Sure, so I, I've been with SES uh, 11 years now. About five years ago, uh, SES allowed me to pursue my passion with drones. We bought our very first drone and I had to manually solder the, the gimbal and the camera onto the drone and we manually flew it. The technology, uh, autonomous flights wasn't even in the cards back then. So fast forward to now, I'm responsible for specking out sensors and drones and looking at the software. I, I'm in, the realm of uh, innovation and I love it. I love the calls we get, you know, can we do this? And, you know, I, 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 I like taking calls from our clients and asking, uh, engaging with them and, and seeing how we can create a workflow to monitor their sites. So um, at, the, at the end of the day, I'm specking out, you know, the, the drones coming down the pipe and uh, adapting sensors. And I love the R&D side that, and that's my role here. Uh, with um, our program. Uh, we can talk about the fleet. So we have 12 drones in our fleet. And um, on the top right, you'll see uh, the Matrice 600. And this is more of our R&D drone. It can pick up 15 pounds in weight and in payload. And we uh, sometimes adapt sensors and we're trying out. It's, um, it's about six feet wide, about my wingspan. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's not our most sophisticated drone, but it's our workhorse for R&D. Moving to the top right is the Matrice 200. And this is the most advanced drone we have. It has anti-collision, the softwares, um, it's all autonomous. We can hook up uh, multiple sensors to it. It can pick up about three pounds. And it's my personally, I love flying this drone. It's, it's, 
quick and nimble, and it gets the job done. In the center is our RTK drone. Uh, we use that primary for photogrammetry and accuracy with photogrammetry. It talks to a base station on the ground and it puts the uh, X, Y, and Z in every picture. And, and it's our workhorse for photogrammetry. We have other drones, but these are the three main ones we um, distribute across the, the, the US to our fleet of pilots. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Mel, you, you, you are, what I understand, in, involved with really the details of, of, I'll call it, making it happen. Tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us a little bit about what, what is it that you do relative to the drone program? Sure. Uh, thank you, Bob, for having us here. And thanks to all the folks joining us today. Uh, my name is Melissa Russo. I'm the business manager for SCS Engineers Remote Monitoring Control Group, or RMC, and the lead manager for RMC's drone services. Uh, I've worked for SCS for 13 years and transitioning from the SCS field services administrative team to the SCS RMC team in 2013. Uh, since then, I've managed the administration and installation of most of the West Coast projects RMC has completed to date. I'm also an FAA licensed drone pilot, uh, leading the development in SES's drone services and helping to find the latest applications that would benefit the clients in their efforts to optimize remote data collection and management. And, um, you know, preparation, planning, creative, creating workflows, that's my favorite part. The success rate on any inspection is contingent upon proper preparation. And to begin, I need to identify the airspace classification and the area we're flying. Depending upon the airspace classification, we may need to request a clearance or a waiver. And this can be as simple as an automated authorization from the FAA or as cumbersome as requesting clearance from multiple local airspace authorities, which has happened to me on numerous occasions. Um, and even with a clearance or a waiver, we might be working around certain restrictions, such as specific days of the week or working within predetermined times of day or following rules that are specific to the area, such as calling the airspace authority prior to each takeoff. And that's even with, you know, battery changes. So uh, once I have the inspection area defined, I can estimate the amount of time it takes to inspect the area and the amount of batteries needed to complete the inspection. I also need to consider the terrain and potential obstacles such as tall trees, buildings, towers, power lines, or tall equipment. Uh, lastly, weather is a, a huge factor. Temperature, wind direction, wind speed, fog, visibility, humidity, precipitation, cloud coverage. This all has to be taken into consideration in order to have a successful operation and obtain optimal results. So just curious, from, from a safety perspective, what technologies or what provisions are in the drone to protect it from kind of just going off on its own or, or you know, how, 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 do you, how do you do this safely? Sure, well, the drone is, has built in um, GPS technology, so we can always see where the drone is. It also, we also make sure that we keep it within range. It has to be within line of sight. Um, it also has built-in safety features such as obstacle avoidance sensors to make sure that it remains a safe distance from people and things. I remember, I just remember early on when drones were being deployed, I had a client, it was like somebody on Christmas day, you know, he, he, get, he gets this toy and he, and he goes up and he's not really, he's not a pilot, he's nothing. He, 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 this is really early on and, and <laughs> The drone, the drone, I guess, got out of line of sight and it kind of disappeared. It was, you know, it, I think it was a fixed wing, you know, so it, it took off and it it uh, ended up in the tree somewhere, you know, and, and it was an expensive situation. So I'm glad to hear that we've got some some controls associated with how that ultimately works. So uh, just if, if somebody calls you up, Mel, and says, I want you to fly my site. How long does it take for that to happen? Well, I, I have quite a bit of experience under my belt. So really it only takes me a couple hours to get all of the planning together um, with, you know, just knowing the boundary of the site and, and the location. Okay. Well, great. Well, let's, let's, let's get into a couple of, I think people will be interested in the specific applications associated with using drones 
And uh, the first one that kind of comes to my mind is the use of, of the drones for facility inspections. And so do you have any examples of where we, we have done that kind of, of work? So with, uh, here's an example of, you know, an infrastructure inspection. Our, with this ability, our clients are able to save time and money by eliminating the need to rent a crane or a man lift or construct scaffolding. We've performed inspections on bridges and building facades, basically all areas and facilities that are inaccessible by foot. And the drone can safely collect high resolution imagery, allowing for you know, quick on the spot analysis and identification of compromised areas in a cost effective way. So Phil, on this one, what are we, what are we looking at? So in, the, in this example, we flew down the flare, we inspected the insulation and we expected the, uh, the burner heads. And we could clearly see detailed high resolution pictures of the, um, any missing insulation and the wear of the burner heads. Then on the exterior, we use a thermal camera to see any spots that have compromised. A lot of times the condensate injection guns get clogged and they're spraying uh, the inside of the flare and you'll see a heat differential um, on the skin of the flare. So we can, we can pinpoint those and show the client, hey, we, we have an issue. Even when the flare is running from the outside, we can inspect you know, all angles top down. So uh, we have a couple different tools to, to see stuff that the normal tech can't see. And we, uh, the normal procedure for looking at the inside of the flare is you, have, you, bl you blind flange it and it's a uh, confined space. And it, there's, there's a lot of time consumption to, to do that. We can quickly turn off the flare, let it cool, fly down, get the, uh, the, the inspection we need you know, within 20 minutes and we're done. So it's just another tool that we've used um, and the flares are a perfect example. So how, in terms of one of the things that I've always been curious about, you're flying down the middle of a tube. Do you ever have any problems with radio frequency interference and so the drone goes nuts or, or does that work pretty well? We're using GPS, uh, 900 megahertz frequency. And it, it, it easily penetrates the flare. We don't have any issue. We get right in the middle we drop down and that drone stays steady. We can spin the drone, spin the camera up and down. It's, uh, it's not a concern. So you've done, you've, you've all have done bridge inspections, you said, or, or facility inspections, building facilities. So that's interesting. Yeah, so I guess you can provide really quick assessment of that kind of. Yeah, a lot of bridges are inaccessible. We can get right underneath them and, and uh, create 3D models for any damage. Um, in the building inspections, we use the thermal camera for heat loss. Uh, we, we get a lot of requests for inspections that, you, you know, normally you can't, areas you can't access. So I mentioned early on about some of the uses, one of them being emergency response and disaster response, I guess. And how have you used drones in that, that regard? So let's just take uh, fires, fires and landfills. Um, these landfills are, are next to wildlife areas and the fires uh, hit the landfills and we're called in to see the damage and to collect, um, you know, for FEMA, you have to report on what was damaged right away. So we'll look at the before and after aerials and take into account all the uh, buildings that got damaged, the, um, the, the gas infrastructure, and we can create assets based upon, uh, quickly create assets comparing before and after. Um, it, another is erosion. After a fire on rivers, the silt runs into the river and we have to, you know, compare on a quarterly basis what's running in. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just another, um, another example. One is uh, flooding. A lot of times uh, our sites get flooded. You can't even access the site and we can see what areas are, are uh, you know, impacted. Temperatures at landfills is a big issue. How are we using drones to monitor for temperatures? So we use a thermal camera. We have a, a, a FLIR, um, can't think of the model. We have multiple FLIR cameras, but we're able to take just like photogrammetry images and each pixel we can get a temperature. So in this example, we created um, a, an overlay for the client showing the, the, where, where the eye of the, of the surface temps were. Uh, as you can see in this example, the eye was 300, 200 degrees. It was, it was uh, pretty hot. And um, this saved the, the technicians going there with uh, manual thermal couples to take uh, readings. 
obviously it, it's a quick way to, to get your service temps and convey that to the engineers and to mitigate the problem on elevated surface temperatures. I remember, you know, I, I, as I indicated, the use of flying things to take pictures isn't new. Obviously, it goes back to World War II and even before uh, as we began flying airplanes. But I think my, my first use of that of this kind of technology is back was back in the mid 1980s, and we were we were flying some landfills in New York and doing some closure plans, and uh, we we were using infrared, which was pretty pretty cool at that juncture. That was pretty pretty neat, I thought. And we would fly fly it, and it was just amazing to me. You could just you could see the heat signatures of the leachate outcrops all along the landfill, which really, from a design perspective, was very helpful because it allowed us to be strategic in terms of where, where we were putting our control systems and dealing with leachate seeps, for example, on the side slopes. That was very helpful to begin to you know, identify this because if you've gone some landfills, they're covered in vegetation. It's sometimes hard to see the erosion. It's sometimes hard to see where you've got a, a, an outbreak. It may be upslope and showing itself somewhere else. Uh, so it's kind of kind of a very uh, helpful uh, process to to do that. Um, I think about in terms of for our clients in terms of helping them operate their landfills more efficiently. How are you using aerial photography and uh, photogrammetry and uh, topographic kind of information? How are you using that to help clients using the drones? Sure, so I'll take this one. With aerial photogrammetry, which is essentially just using imagery to measure the distance between things and interpret that kind of information, we're able to generate high resolution 2D imagery and video, and we can generate 3D topographic mapping, which provides our clients with current and highly accurate airspace, stockpile, and settlement calculations, allowing the landfill owners and managers the ability to effectively track and generate and conserve landfill airspace. Um, the technology can be used you know, on multiple purposes, many applications across many industries, such as pre and post construction and engineering and pipelines, all of which we've, we have experience in. So what are we looking at here? So in this example, the client wanted to see uh, the compaction uh, efficiency so we were flying the face. You're looking at the open face where um, the trucks are coming in and they're unloading the trash and the operations are compacting it and moving it around. So the client wanted to calculate the volume. We were flying it every day and he was seeing the efficiency of um, their compaction. Wow. But we're, we're looking at the open, what they call the open face of the landfill here. And, and those numbers are a, a quick calculation the client was doing. So. A lot of times we'll fly it and we'll upload it to a platform that's automating the reports of, of how much was filled. Um, and we, and the client's interacting with our software. And are you able, is, so the output of this can go into an AutoCAD file or, and, and be manipulated? AutoCAD, GIS, um, and, uh, and automated reports go into the client. Okay. Um, so the it, yeah any any CAD software any GIS uh, output then we have our own platform uh, using an enterprise uh, Esri enterprise platform to for all this data to be overlaid and compared over time and, and for our clients to interact with. One of the questions that was asked is uh, would the what's the accuracy of the drone photogrammetry relative to replacing surveying. So we still use surveyors to set ground control points and we pick up those ground control points and incorporate that into the photogrammetry to align it. So it's centimeter accuracy to answer your question, but we still work with surveyors and a lot of times um, they, they still have to approve our output for construction and, and civil work. Okay. The, the biggest difference also is that we don't need as many ground control points when we're using the drone, especially with our RTK, which stands for real-time kinematic. And what that means is while it's flying in the air, it's connecting to a base station and connecting to satellites. So it's auto-correcting its GPS location every time that it's moving around. That in conjunction with tying into the ground control points laid by the surveyor, we're able to really get an accurate read on anything, but like I said, without needing as many ground control points. So it's a much more efficient way. 
So the, the next part uh, associated with drones that I think is interesting is the use of it for monitoring. Uh, methane monitoring, and one of the questions that was asked, do we have the ability to monitor H2S emissions, for example? Um, so what, what can we monitor? And what's the, what are the limitations associated with monitoring using drones? Sure, so right now our bread and butter is methane inspections. And one of the benefits of an aerial methane inspection is the ability to provide our clients the information they need to mitigate potential emissions exceedances prior to regulatory inspections in an efficient and cost-effective way. The drone has autonomous flight functionality meaning we can set specific flight parameters and the drone will perform the inspection uh, on its own. And this optimizes our time, allowing us to cover up to 500 acres in a day. It also lets us customize the flight to meet our client's needs. And here's a screenshot of the software we use to perform an aerial methane inspection. And as you can see, we can set parameters for the flight such as grid spacing, we can do a single grid or a double grid, we can set the flight speed or the path direction, the flight height, and we also use true terrain following, meaning the drone stays at a relatively same height above ground level throughout the inspection, which is a setting we use to obtain reliable data. And one of the features of the software is that we're able to see instantaneous methane readings, which you can see right here. Uh, while the drone is in the air. So it gives us the ability to send the boots on the ground to a particular hotspot to quickly identify the area of concern and make the appropriate repairs. One of the questions that was asked is traditional plane uh, flown aerial photography and photogrammetry shows other landfill features such as access roads and site structures. And they say that when uh, I receive drone flight data to create a topography map in, in civil 3D, I'm only getting data to produce contours. Can I get traditional structure data uh, from a drone flight? Uh, absolutely. So your, your, your photogrammetry, your topo is de derived from your photogrammetry. So you can, we often put multiple cameras, but your, your main RGB camera is uh, picking up the, the photogrammetry. And then uh, we use PIX4D for the, the to, to output the topo and you can pick your intervals, one foot contours, three foot contours. Um, so it, it's the, the, the plane and the drone has the same method um, or let, let's just throw in satellite. Satellite, plane, drones, it's all photogrammetry and you're deriving your topo from, from that. Uh, Phil, could you kind of go uh, again, the, the main drone manufacturers that you're using? Somebody asked that question again. Um, sure. Um, we, we primarily use DJI. Um, we've looked at some of our R&D drones, our, our US base, but um, DJI is our go-to. Okay, uh, this is a good question. Um, say for example, you go out to a job site to do drone work, whether uh, it's to update aerials or do inspections of VOCs, what is the backup plan should a drone crash? Is there a second drone ready to fly? Or how do you? Yeah, what is contingency? What's the contingency planning? Sure. So planning, it's, I mean, it not only gives me peace of mind, but most importantly, it helps me find the most efficient way to collect accurate and reliable data for our clients. So for example, uh, if I'm flying for topo or 3D modeling, I want to fly midday where I won't see many shadows in the imagery or with a methane inspection, I'd want to fly where there's low wind for minimal plume mobility, allowing us to capture the point of emission. That said, as this, <laughs> this person asked, there are some uncertainties that are out of our control. Uh, we've had to work around you know, a flock of birds or we've had a wild landfill dog attack one of our drones upon takeoff. Um, we've you know, had to worry about bears and donkeys, eagles, hawks chasing the drone, low flying planes or helicopters, a rogue rain cloud. Um, this is all where our experience and preparation really kicks into gear. And to answer that person's question, we always have a plan B and a plan C, and that includes a backup drone. Um, back on the survey question, uh, what tools are, are you using to verify the accuracy of drone data? In other words, what's the QAQC plan to ensure the data is defendable? Sure, so just like um, if you ever see an X on the ground, we'll have, um, the surveyor shoot that point in and he's responsible for creating that X and he's uh, he shoots that in for us and marks it. 
Okay. Um, then there's another tool um, called arrow points. We deploy these X's, it's our own. And we, we that's our backup, for instance. And then the third is the RTK base. We're always comparing the data. And at the end of the day, it's up to the, uh, the surveyor to provide and verify the accuracy of all three of these tools. What's the max height? You typically fly a drone or can fly a drone? Legally 400 feet and we don't- We have to stay below 400 feet above ground level. Um, but it really depends on the output. If we are flying for methane, we stay below 100 feet above ground level. Um, between 75 and 95 feet above ground level is our sweet spot. Um, if we're flying for topo, then it's usually 250 to 300 feet above ground level. Okay, are the, are the uh, ground control points RTK on the drone? The arrow points are RTK. They're, they can be built into the RTK system. Um, this, the standard you know, X on the ground or, or monument, that, that's not RTK. That's, that's the standard method, the old school method of shooting it in. Uh, they, they use a total station or um, Trimble system to, to get the coordinates of that ground control point. So they'll come off a benchmark at the site and establish the, the actual control point. That yeah, if they're using a local coordinate system that they're, they're establishing that, or if they're using state plane, we leave that up to the surveyor. So uh, somebody asked the question about hydrogen sulfide. Are we doing anything in that regard at this juncture relative to drones? So with hydrogen sulfide, uh, unlike, so for, let's, let's take a step back. Um, for methane, we use a tunable laser. They haven't made a tunable laser for the drone for H2S. We can draw a sample. We have a pump and we can draw um, a sample in a bag and then send that, that bag sample to the lab or test it on the ground. But there isn't a tunable laser for H2S on the drone that's instantaneous. We have sampled uh, the perimeter fence line, uh, you know, uh, flown each, each uh, say the property has uh, four sides. Each bag has a side, and then we, we send it into the lab or sample it once we land. Okay. You you mentioned the use of satellite imagery. I'm I'm curious about that. How do we how do we how do we do that? How do we coordinate that? How do you get it? What what how is that used? So it, it, a lot of times we don't know where the leak's coming from, and and the client um, assumes that it's either they're either generating the leak or it's coming off site. So we have um, a number of contracts with uh, methane, methane satellite companies, and we have to give them two weeks in advance. They calibrate to the property, and you're getting an image of nine by nine square miles. Each pixel you see is 30 by 30 meters, and that's, uh, that's the resolution ultimately, is 30 by 30 meters per pixel. So the, the technology on satellite uh, methane is, is Every year that goes by, it's leaps and bounds. And um, a lot of times what we found, um, if we don't know where the leak's coming from, we'll look, we'll look at the property. We found that it's not coming from the suspected property or the client's, our client's property. It's coming from offsite. Then we can focus the drone on finding the exact leak. Is it a, a well? Is it a tank? Is it a sewer? You know, we can, using the drone to pinpoint it. But satellite's a good tool for an overview. So what are, I just took your slide, what, what are we looking at? So the, the, the red is the higher concentrations and, and um, you see the color scale. Um, and this is, uh, I'm trying to look at the site, but um, so the, the, ultimately you can, you can see this is nine by nine square miles we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And we, we were able to zero in on on where to start the inspection with the drone or with the uh, boots on the ground inspection. And, and let me specify, so you have photogrammetry done by satellite that's high resolution and then you have methane. It's two different, um, it's two different protocols, it's two different orders to the satellite companies. And typically, um, so if you order it, best case scenario, they can look at it in two weeks when the satellite passes uh, comes around on that property. If you have to have line of sight, if there's any sort of cloud cover, all that's off. You have to wait for another two weeks. A lot of times we, we waited three months for um, line of sight on a property. Or mm -hmm. if it's, you know, if it's in summer, there's good weather, we can get it uh, pretty quickly. 
Mel, uh, we're, we're using GIS, I assume, a lot in, in terms of to manage the spatial data and to visualize that spatial data. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and how you see that being used in the future potentially as well. Yeah, well, right now it's mainly being tied. I mean, we can use it for, for multiple applications, but kind of getting back to the methane inspection, once I complete an aerial methane inspection, um, I'm able to generate, you know, maps using ArcGIS, which is a geographic information system. And I'll show you one of our demo sites here on my screen. Um, this is a demo site showing aerial methane capture, which I will show you right now. Here's our aerial methane. Um, as you can see, we can add multiple layers to this, including the as-built. Um, we can add high resolution imagery of the site, which you see here. And if I take away some of these layers, we can really zone it, zone in on certain areas. That is actually our launching point right there. Um, and as you can see, it's rendered down pretty well for this, but it's still very, you know, it's high resolution imagery. So this is just used as a reference point for our clients when they're looking at some of this um, aerial methane data. We can also overlay it with SEM data or surface emissions monitoring data. And what our clients love about this is that they can compare the two data sets either with a sliding feature like you see here, or with a 3D data point, and I'll show you what that looks like. Let that render down just a moment. So while Mel is pulling that up, we recently launched an enterprise version of uh, Esri's uh, uh, software. Um, we're running that on, on our Amazon servers, and um, it allows us to, you know, create data sets over time and overlay these and you know, when you do a typical drone flight, you're talking about terabytes of data. And before we had the, the enterprise system, they would sit just on our servers and we would give the deliverables in CAD and, and they're very cumbersome files. Now with the enterprise server, we can, we can um, safely store all this data and convey it over uh, multiple layers, whether it's satellite, plane, or drone imagery, or for, for that matter, uh, boots on the ground data, we can combine them all and tell the story. That's right. And what you're seeing on this screen right now is we kind of we, we want to make it easy for our clients to understand. So we created we overlaid the SEM data or the surface emissions monitoring methane data with our aerial methane data in conjunction with high resolution imagery and the terrain model of the site. Um, and put it in a 3D map. So all the data points that you're seeing on the ground are from the ground inspection. All the data points that you're seeing right here that are kind of floating in the air, those are from the aerial methane inspection. So this gives our clients the ability to, you know, look at a large scale view of the site or really hone in on some problem areas. Um, and as you can see, you know, as an example, this area, there's looking like there's some hot hits right here. And when we've compared uh, ground data to our aerial data, we're finding that the readings are comparable. Um, for example, here's a data point at 1,851 ppm um, from the surface emissions monitoring. And just above that, we're getting readings of 1,952 ppm per meter or 1,760 ppm per meter. Um, on these data points, you can also see that it, it gives an ID of the data point, it gives a timestamp, the latitude and longitude, um, the value, we can incorporate weather data, we can incorporate, um, you see the value. I mean, this is really customizable to whatever the client is wanting to see on these maps. So what, what, what was that big black pile? Was that a pile of tires? That was a pile of tires, yes. <laughs> I, guess, I guess inspectors, I guess a county inspector could use a drone for inspection of various uh, land use violations. <laughs> yeah, and you know, like I said, our GIS services aren't limited to methane or uh, topo or imagery. It's multifaceted. We can incorporate gas collection systems, liquid systems, asset maintenance and management, and data analysis. It, 
really gives our clients the ability to track and analyze the evolution of their site over time. Um, you know, and like Phil said, we've gone to the extent of acquiring satellite methane imagery and incorporating that into our GIS system. So really the, the sky's the limit, pun intended. <laughs> Phil, in terms of, I mean, can you think of any specific examples, you know, getting down to brass tacks here, that how the drone really has helped our clients either manage their facilities better, maintain compliance or solve a problem using this technology? You know, right off the bat, we found leaks that they just couldn't find. Um, we can go where the boots on the ground can't, you know, highly vegetated areas off site. And we've, uh, there's been a number of instances where they can't find the leak. We can find it in a day or two and we're, and they're mitigating it. Um, then the other, the other big thing is it seems that, you know, after natural disasters, we can get there quick and assess the damage. Um, and it's, it's, it's been a great tool to, to help our clients, you know, with insurance and, and helping them get back up and running quickly. We're, we're the first ones there assessing it and then getting the engineers the information, getting the client the information to get that site back up after fires or flooding or whatever the, the disaster is. Interesting. Um, one of the questions that was asked is, have you measured solar reflectance with a drone or perhaps on the surface of a liner or other application? No, I, I've never done that. I, I'm willing to uh, look into it though. Yeah. <laughs> we've, met, we've, we've assessed solar panels inspections to see um, using the, the thermal to see if any of them compromise, but that would be a good one. I'd love to look into that. That would yeah, be interesting. Huh. You have to find some type of the, the right, the right uh, sensor, I guess, huh? Yeah. Any limitations that need to be considered when you're when you're using a drone um you know for example you know i think about methane monitoring for example i mean you're measuring a column of air and what, what are some of the you know what what, what, what what when you're looking at the data what do you have to really think about the first thing that comes to mind is the weather what's your wind speed how is it carrying that methane it, you know or even flying the drone you know i personally will down the drone any 12, 15 miles an hour, it's really moving that drone around. So you have to take into safety considerations. Temperature, when we've flown some cold places and it uh, degrades your batteries, it'll drain your batteries quicker. Hmm. Um, I've flown out with the wind that I'm fighting the wind coming back and it's draining that battery. So just weather in general, um, you're always gotta check your batteries. The, the radios will, will communicate five miles out but your, your, your battery is only gonna last you 20 minutes out, 20 minutes back. So your battery constraints are definitely a uh, consideration. Uh, regulatory, you know, line of sight, we have to have spotters. You gotta keep an eye on that drone. Like I said, that drone can, the radio communications are advancing. You, could, you can communicate five miles out, but you can't fly five miles out without keeping an eye on that drone. So you have to keep, you know, know your regulations and, for monitoring too, knowing that, you know, a lot of these technologies aren't approved by the regulators in association with methane. So this are, the, are the, are the drone electronics, are they intrinsically safe? Um, or are there issues, you, you had to be careful if you went into a combined space that was, for example, you know, explosive kind of in, in methane environment, uh, are they intrinsically safe or, or no? So any DC, so when you, when you get into DC, it's considered low voltage. So all these, our batteries are 12 and 24 volts, uh, considered low voltage, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't fly a drone in a confined space. That's just not in the cards. Um, but we, we definitely are always, uh, it's more so for the pilots on the ground. We've been in situations where there's elevated temperatures and there's smoke and we've had to change our points of launch because we're just in the middle of downwind of a, a you know, a combustible fire, you know? Um, and, you know, we are, we take in the cons same considerations. All our pilots have uh, the, the H2S monitors and, and we're, we're doing the same safety parameters as the, the technicians monitoring wells and keep, keeping, you know, we still have to keep in mind there's heavy equipment rolling around um, and we try to fly off site, but sometimes because of line of sight, we go on site and we just got to keep an eye on operations and, and stay in tune to, to what the site's doing. Drill rigs, um, 
drill rigs can move, they have a hundred foot boom. So if there's multiple drill rigs on a site, you, you gotta be aware of where they're at and where, where they're drilling. Somebody made the comment, interesting one, that they had a drone ready to fly at their site on a particular day, but the FAA issued a no-fly everyone in Southern California because President Trump was flying to Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we've run into to temporary no-fly zones as well. Um, you know, when there's fires going on in Southern California, that's a regular issue for us. You know, uh, local authorities will will put a temporary no-fly zone so they can mitigate the fire that's happening, and that allows for you know, the fire department can safely fly and, and dump water wherever they're dumping. Um, so in those cases, yeah, we've gone to a site and it's just been like emergency response only. We are not allowed to take off. What do you, what, what, what's the future look like? Uh, what, what are you thinking about? You said you're, you're kind of the R&D guy, Phil. Um, and also the question for you, Mel, what, what, do you, what are you thinking about? Where, where do you see the use of drones going? I'm personally excited for VTOLs. It's vertical takeoff and landing. So it's a hybrid glider and drone. It takes off like a drone. The, um, the props pivot and it starts gliding. And then it, it, they'll switch back when you land. It's a VTOL. What does this do? You can stay in the air three, four hours. And right now it's, it's, it's a reality. We're just we're trans, uh, testing sensors to put on VTOLs and I'm really excited to implement VTOLs. And I think that's the future. Um, they're just more efficient. Uh, you, you can't pick up as much when you're gliding, but the sensors are getting lighter. And I, I really think the future is with the, these hybrid VTOLs. So how, uh, do they, how do they do that in terms of, you know, a, a, you know if you're on a glide path, you're, 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 you're at, you're, at, you're at a glided angle, right? I mean, you're not at a constant elevation, or are you? Or, or... No, so they'll kick. So it's the, you got to remember the rotors are turning and they'll kick on for lift. So it's gliding, and if they say it's losing out, it'll it, it'll supplement it with the rotors moving, pivoting. Okay. Yeah, it, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, the other thing that satellite monitoring in the last couple of years, it's higher and higher resolution. On the photogrammetry side, you're seeing way better res resolution. On the methane side, the resolutions improve. They keep launching satellites and they're getting better and better. And I think, you know, in a couple years, the, the, a lot of this monitoring is gonna turn this, uh, to satellite because uh, the, the technology, is, it's moving quickly and it's getting better. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned the use of bridge, bridge inspections and, and erosion and sedimentation control. Is that mostly just the the visual imagery that you're using, or are they do they do other things with drones relative to inspections of those kinds of things? Do they have also sensors that you're aware of? So on, on the um, let, let's just dissect this here. Um, bridge inspections, it's photogrammetry, looking at the infrastructure. Um, a lot of the, the the sediment they're looking for, you know, after a fire that the silt comes in and starts it starts building up. Then we're telling the client when they need to dredge that river. Um, a lot of times we're looking at um, we have a couple projects on the coast. We're looking at uh, habitat, endangered habitat. So we're flying it quarterly, seeing birds nesting and migrating. It's really cool and erosion of their habitat. Then th those are the jobs I personally enjoy because. You know, they're on the ocean, you're seeing dunes. It's just, it's, you know, a lot of this is you're, you're with nature and you're seeing wildlife and it, it's, uh, it's just beautiful, beautiful scenery. And uh, th those are the jobs I personally like. Uh, I think early on, Phil, when, when you, you and I both surf and, and when, when you first started doing the drone stuff, I remember the, at our group, at our te in-house technical meetings, I remember you, you showing uh, drone photography of the surf. I said, this is a good, this is a great application. I like this one. <laughs> I, I personally fly the drone out and I'll check the surf. I live on the beach and um, I use it as my surf cam. I'll check the waves and, and fly, fly off my balcony and come back just to see uh, what's cool. going on. So how many of our staff are currently uh, qualified to fly drones? Uh, we have about a dozen nationwide right now and we're growing. We're constantly adding, um, adding to our fleet of pilots. And uh, in terms of if a staff member wants to start work, work with drones, how do they go about gaining that ability? What's the process of becoming a pilot? 
Uh, Phil and I are pretty hands-on with our pilots, um, not only to get them through the FAA testing, but we also have created a workflow internally to SCS, um, just depending on what the what our client's outcome is looking like. Uh, so we go over that. You know, we're very hands-on with the FAA training and with our personal workflows. I would also like to add uh, Carl Cortez. Uh, he he also was instrumental in, in starting this drone program. He, you know, he, he's looking at the insurance, the regulations, log books, our pilots have to keep, you know, detailed logs of drone maintenance, weather, you're treated as a pilot. And, you know, when you go take your 107 test, they treat you like you're flying a regular plane. And but Carl is a manned pilot. <laughs> <laughs> but Carl is, uh, you know, he, he, he flies helicopters and he's an experienced pilot and he's really guided us in that aspect. So I'd really like to give a shout out to him. And um, he keeps track of the, the now we have to register all our drones, get them insured, you know, the whole fleet. Um, as we retire drones, they got to be taken off. We register them with the FAA and he's instrumental in keeping all that going. And, and uh, over all the pilots, we have a list everybody has to be insured and vetted and making sure they're safe. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a, the, the program's growing and uh, there's a lot of administrative that, that Mel and Carl are, are looking after. I got appreciation for the complexity of it all. My dad was a pilot and after he passed away, I was going through all his books and stuff. And I came across a bunch of books on, you know, getting a license for a pilot and, just, just the issues of weather and, and, and fronts and the, the movement of air from a cold to a hot front, whether you're approaching from the cold front side or the warm front side, what happens to, you know, what happens to your lift when you go in into those kind of, I, 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 I kind of tilted. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that being said, we had to renew, I had to renew my, my license. We, we renew it every two years and you go down into a, a field office and you take a test and there's new regulations you got to keep up with. And I was, you know, the night before I was re reviewing all the new regs and practicing for the test. And uh, it's, it's you, you can pass it once, but in another two years, you got to pass it again and keep up to date with, with all the new changing FAA regulations. Well, we're getting up to the, the, uh, the end of our, our talk. I want to give you both a chance. Any, any closing thoughts that you want to offer the group before we um, bring this to an end? I personally want to thank SES for, you know, just being able to back a program like this and, and having the vision and the foresight to, to let us uh, run with this. And um, I like, uh, you know, we're pushing the limit and I like to thank our clients for collaborating with us for new ideas. And I'm excited for the future and new drones and new sensors we're going to put on. So thank you. Mel, anything on your side? What he said, I couldn't okay. have said better myself. <laughs> One, one question that came in here, let me see if I can read this right. I said, do you work with data flown by a client? For example, some landfill owners have their own contractors flying their annual topography, which we are then asked to turn into a topo map, which is not always easy. What do we ask for to be able to use client flown data? So the answer is yes, absolutely. If you want us to process it, and then take it over to ArcGIS to show the different, say we're showing the total quarterly. We'll gladly do that. So any A to Z, if you want us to, to put, stitch that all together and host that on our ArcGIS um, enterprise uh, platform, we can do that. We can add insight, we'll help you, you know, we'll work with you. If you have pilots on the ground who are just collecting the data, we can take it from there. Any, any you know, give us a call, well, let's talk. Excellent. Well, thanks, uh, Mel and Phil. Uh, ex excellent information and informative. We've covered a wide range of topics. We've, we've talked about aerial photography, aero topographic surveys, fill sequencing, thermal imagery, gas monitoring, habitat monitoring, emergency response, streaming erosion control, utility. We didn't really talk much about utility and pipeline alignments, but the, those are all. We also do that uh, in terms of flying alignments and figuring out where they're going to put pipelines. And infrastructure inspections, um, very very helpful and very very useful. 
um, information. And there's one more question here. Used to have a UAV company, is the line of business profitable these days? I'll, I'll take that. So we're, we're, I'll tell you the things we don't do. Real estate, uh, we focus on environmental. There's a lot of applications for drones. Um, we, we tend to be in more niche monitoring and we don't see a lot of competition. I don't know what that's gonna be like, but um, there's, there's a million different ways you can go with, with uh, a UAV business. We just happen to serve uh, our clients and SES and you know, we're growing. We started off, I started off as the only pilot, then you know, we, we're adding pilots. So yeah, the business is growing. Uh, Mal can talk to, you know, she's, she gets calls all the time and we're, we're having to add people. And, so I, I believe in the environmental, I can only speak to the environmental, uh, you know, monitoring and, and contracting, it's growing. I don't know about the other sectors, but um, it, it's, it's, I'm excited. I'm excited for the future and I see a big uptrend. Yeah, I think it's important to note that, you know, sure, anyone can go and get their FA you know, remote pilot license, but what is the goal? What's the outcome? For us, we, we know what our clients are wanting. We know what they're looking for. We know what's important to them um, and, and what will benefit their operations. I also probably wouldn't go into another industry that I knew nothing about. I would want to research that and make sure that I was addressing my clients' needs in the way that they're wanting rather than just, you know, I have a pilot license, I'll fly it for you. Here's the data. It's, it's not useful unless it's useful, right? Like stock market, you know, <laughs> invest in what you know. <laughs> Diane, uh, I know there are a couple of questions re regarding the use of, uh, you know, being able to access the this webinar series after it's closed. You might want to kind of summarize that for the group. Yes, uh, we did record the session with all the Q&A and I will post that in YouTube and I will send you a, each person who registered and each person who attended today will get a link to the uh, recording. In addition, uh, you'll in that email that has the link to our learning center, uh, you can also respond back to me if you would like the slide set or if you would like to receive a certificate certificate of attendance we will provide that as well excellent well again thank you everybody uh, for participating today hopefully you found the information helpful and ultimately useful uh, we hope you have the opportunity to, to fly one of your sites and to help you out in your operations um, thank you so much thank have you bye everyone bye bye, bye.